Good morning, my name is Andrea Bassing Matney and I am the Community Outreach Programs and Support Specialist for the Research Services at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the second day of the 2014 Virtual Genealogy Fair. A few quick notes before we start. We have allotted 10 minutes for questions and answers. You can submit your questions for a speaker via Twitter using hashtag GenFair2014. For captioning, go to the Virtual Genealogy Fair website and click on the link for today. Lectures will be recorded and posted on the Virtual Genealogy Fair website by the end of November. If you are following along from home, this is session number five. The lecture is entitled, Great Granny Eunice Came from Ireland, Grandpa Fred Was in the War, Can Access to Archival Databases, AAD, Help Me? And our speaker is John Leglowick. Access to Archival Databases has helpful information for genealogists because it contains 60 different series with more than 100 million records. AAD allows researchers to access electronic data files from anywhere around the world. John will highlight records of interest to genealogists, including immigration and passenger list records and the World War II Army enlistment files. He will also provide an introduction to navigating AAD and how to search the records. John Legoic is an archive specialist for the records, Electronic Records Division. He works at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. I am turning the microphone over to John. Thank you very much, Andrea, and good morning to all of those joining us for the National Archives Virtual Genealogy Fair. I'm very excited to be with you today on this second day of the fair. What I hope, hope to accomplish here today is to help you navigate NARA's Access to Archival Databases, or AED, with your genealogical research. It is altogether fitting that this presentation be virtual, as anyone can search AAD from the comfort of their own homes, in your PJs, or from any internet-connected computer, but you may need clothes if you're at the local library or internet cafe. I think it's a fair statement to say that most genealogists like the feel of stuff, letters, photographs, family Bibles, memorabilia, and ephemera from a family they are trying to learn more about. However, let's look at permanence for a moment. All of the physical items that I just mentioned will be around for a long time, but if you stop and think about all that other stuff that is being created constantly in this era, emails, cell phone pictures, Facebook postings, blog entries, even to a certain extent this presentation, these are all examples of electronic records. Now there are some that say that electronic records aren't sexy, though I'm pretty fond of them as most of my colleagues are in electronic records. Make no mistake, in no way does their existence lessen the impact that they can have to providing a much needed clue to a family's history. In the electronic records reference branch, the majority if not all of the genealogical questions we receive often concern the area like the title of my presentation or in the question seen here, people are searching for immigration records of an ancestor who came to the United States or they're trying to find out more information about a relative who fought in one of the several conflicts of the 20th century. Luckily for us and for you, we have a rich history of records to draw upon to answer all of those requests. The Electronic Records Division of the National Archives has been collecting records of the federal government for more than 40 years. While some of the records date back to World War II, in some instances even earlier, the majority of all, if not all, of the records in our custody are born digital records of the federal government. By that I mean they have never existed on paper. If you search in the National Archives online catalog, you'll find more than 30,000 descriptions of electronic records, which translate to millions of logical data records or LDRs. We define an LDR as one individual record, a row of data in a database, or one PDF document to cite two examples. Once the records have been processed by NARA staff, we identify certain records as appropriate for AAD. Now what do we mean when we say an appropriate AAD record? Well, it's those records that identify specific persons geographic areas, events, activities, organizations, messages, 
or that are indices to other records. The AED system does not support quantitative or statistical analysis of data. For a record to be in AED, we need to answer the one question, can the record stand by itself and still have meaning? To date, we have made more than 100 million records available through AED. That means, that means something to a lot of people if the statistics are to be believed. Also in the custody of the Electronic Records Division are hundreds of linear feet, thousands of pages of textual document documentation provided by transferring agencies or created by the National Archives to help researchers like you interpret the records we make available. Upon accessing the AAD homepage, you can see the URL listed at the top of the slide. You have the option of conducting a free text search by typing text into the green search AAD box. Please note that the search option looks at the records themselves and not the series titles. You may also conduct more specific searches by narrowing your search by selecting one of the categories listed in the red browse categories box. As you can see, you can also access a more substantive list of subjects by clicking browse by subjects and you can see all series available in AAD by clicking show all series in the red banner. Also helpful at the bottom of the AAD main, main page are the purple What's New box, which contains the most recent additions to AAD, the teal colored AAD highlights box that illustrates some of the specific records one can find in AAD, and the blue most popular box that lists those series that are accessed most frequently. Please note the Getting Started Guide accessible on the right side of the home page with the chalkboard and identified with the blue arrow is a helpful resource to navigate AAD. This information is also available as one of today's handouts. So let's get started. I'm fairly confident that no one thinks of ship passenger lists and electronic records in the same thought. However, there are four series of records in, available on AAD, making up more than six million records of passengers arriving at the ports of Baltimore, Boston, New Orleans, New York, and Philadelphia. The passenger list records came to the National Archives from the Center for Immigration Research at the Balch Institute for Ethnic Studies, which created a database with extracted information from the original paper passenger lists. This has allowed genealogists to search for names of individuals and or the names of ships that carried immigrants to our shores, in addition to providing the ability to undertake statistical research on the records. Parenthetically, I'll point out that the Balch Institute merged with the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in 2002, and the Institute contains a wealth of information that is very helpful to genealogists, and anyone may access the Balch Institute homepage from the URL listed at the bottom of the slide. Now let's see if we can find Great Granny Eunice. Using the free text search box, I've typed Eunice into the box. I don't remember what Great Granny Eunice's last name was at the time, it's a big family secret. As you can see in the blue box, there are six records containing Eunice, four in the Germans to America and two in the Irish famine records. I'm pretty sure that Great Granny Eunice was from France, but that's not an option here. So let's see what's in the German file. Of the four records that appear in the Germans to America passenger data file, three individuals are look listed as German or Prussian, and then we find Eunice Cretin from France. Approximately 10% of the Germans to America file contain records of individuals who are not German. And here's Great Granny Eunice, one of that 10%. It shows Great Granny Eunice's name and age, and then there is this manifest identification number, which will tell us the name of the ship on which she traveled. I'll get back to that in a moment, but let's have a look at Great Granny Eunice's full record. Great Granny Eunice was 28 years old and a governess. Now, we've all seen The Sound of Music, right? So I don't have to explain what a governess is. The full record also indicates that she may or may not have been able to read. However, as a governess, let's hope so. I'd like to pause here and tell a quick story that illustrates how records can tell you something that may not make sense, but because of the way it was documented, that's what you get. I searched for my mother in the 1930 census, and she was born in March of 1930, and the enumeration took place in April of that year. On the enumeration rolls, one of the questions asked was whether the individual could speak English. My grandfather, quite the character, informed the enumerator of the residents in the household, and as a result, the line on the census roll for my mother 
indicates an age of one twelfth and that she could not speak English. But knowing how my mother was, it was certainly not for a lack of trying. As to Eunice, she was traveling to the United States to stay, presumably to care for the children with whom she was serving as governess. Now let's get back and have a look at that manifest identification number. Making a note of the manifest identification number, 33179, I return to the series list and click on the manifest header data file listed under the Germans to America data file where the left arrow is pointed. I can place the manifest ID in the green free text search box as indicated by the upper right arrow or I can put it in the fielded search box as I have done here under the lower right arrow and click the search, arrow, search button. The search returns one record matching the ID, the Europe, which sailed from two French seaports, Brest and Le Havre, and arrived in New York on October 23, 1873. Now I know that, Europe, that the Europe arrived in New York as opposed to another port because looking at the FAQs for this series, I learned that the manifest ID of 33179 indicates an arrival in New York. You can also click on the manifest identification number and you'll get a pop-up window as seen here on the right that will show you the numbering convention for the ships arriving from Europe and not just for ships named Europe. Here you can see how to access the FAQs for the series, either by clicking on the down arrow next to the file unit information or clicking on the view the FAQs for this series. I've indicated those two options with the blue arrows. Here are the three frequently asked questions addressed for this series, answering questions about the records themselves, questions dealing with the searches conducted on the records, and results found in AAD, as well as to obtain copies of the ship's manifest and passenger lists. Now, before we move on, I would like to share with you a nugget that one of my colleagues discovered while working with AAD records. Let's search for Patrick Henry, which returns more than 3,800 records. Now, the reason for such a large volume of returned records is due to the fact that AAD is searching records with Patrick Henry in every field, including both ship and person names. From the search results, let's have a look at the Irish famine records. We learn that Patrick Henry Greenway was born at sea aboard the ship Patrick Henry. In October of 1850, there on the left, you can see a picture of the ship and not Master Greenway, en route to America and his full passenger list record on the right. Now let's switch gears a little and move forward in time. For our next demonstration, we will look at the Electronic Army Serial Number File, or ASNF. The ASNF is the most frequently accessed set of records available on AAD with the National Personnel Record Center, or NPRC, in St. Louis as the most frequent user. As most of you know, there was a fire at the NPRC in 1973, which resulted in the loss of hundreds of thousands of official military personnel files, or OMPFs. The creation of the ASNF was one step in the reconstruction process to ensure that our veterans could and would receive their rightful benefits. And the NPRC uses AAD to verify World War II service. The ASNF contains more than 9 million records of men and women who joined the United States Army between 1938 and 1946. Please note that it does not include the records of officers, and enlistment information was captured on punch cards, an example of which you can see here that contained the enlistee's name, their date of birth, where they enlisted, and when they signed up, along with other specific demographic information. The information was entered on the punch cards by humans, and sometimes humans make mistakes. As a result, some of the information was incorrectly captured. The punch cards were later microfilmed and subsequently digitized to give us the file we use on AAD. Unfortunately, due to the poor condition of some of the microfilm reels, some of the information could not be converted, and as a result, there are gaps in the records, so even computers make mistakes too, but don't tell them that, it makes them angry. On this slide, we can see an example of the data captured from the punch cards, reading from left to right. You can see the individual service number, their name, followed by data values, which can be translated through the use of code lists, also available through AAD. <coughs> 
A cautionary note here, like any record, users should be beware that the records are only as accurate as the information that was given by the inv individual and subsequently recorded by the person receiving that information. Now, we often receive requests to correct information in the serial number file. For example, we recently received a request from a man who wrote us to let us know that the information regarding his father was incorrect. The man noted his father's date of birth was 1932, but the record on AED notes his date of birth as 1928. The son told us that the father likely lied to the recruiter, a somewhat common practice. Therefore, what we have is correct as it was entered, and despite a claim that the information is wrong in real life, we often find ourselves telling people that unfortunately NARA does not change incorrect records that have been accessioned into the custody of the National Archives. Now, if you're just starting out and you're not sure what you need, it's often best to start with the series descriptions and the technical information for the series in which you are researching. Here you can see the series description for ASNF. There are FAQs for all of the series in AAD, and there are often helpful little nuggets of information found within. And here's an information of the FAQs, an image of the FAQs for serial number. Now, once you have identified, searched, and or selected a list of records, you can download those records, if under 1,000 records, out of AAD to review the data in a more manageable format by clicking on the download results shown in the blue box with the upper arrow of the slide. You can print out individual records as well. The code lists used to identify the data values may also be downloaded from AAD. Now, of course, if you're just interested in the enlistment record of George Bailey, you can just get that too, as you can see by Jimmy Stewart's enlistment record here, the second one on the list shown. In addition, the ASNF is also available for free download from NARA's online catalog. That's right, you can have all nine million records dumped right onto your computer if you so desired. You can see the download page here. Now, so what information can you find in the full record? One of the most important pieces of information is the individual's service number. The first item listed on the record, that is the number that individuals need to request their official military personnel files from the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. In the first column, shown with the blue arrow, you can see the field title, which gives the title of the field from the records. The second column, indicated by the green arrow, shows the data value assigned to that particular field, the information that was captured. The final column with the red arrow is the translated data. For example, as you can see here, this record is for a cousin of mine who fought in World War II. My cousin lived and enlisted in the state of Maine, joined the Army in 1943, and the other information that appeared on his draft card is re reflected in this record. It is noteworthy that at the end of all of the serial number records are recorded values titled box number and film reel number that refer to the initial microfilming of the serial number file, but these records cannot be traced back to a particular microfilm reel or card. Another question that we field a lot. Once you have located a full record like this one here, you can print out the record by clicking the print icon at the top of the page shown in the blue box. Now let's see if we can find what Grandpa Fred did in the war. Unfortunately, he doesn't talk much about what happened to him in the war, and since he's pushing 95, it's hard to find out what he did in the Second World War. Let's do a search for Frederick Irving on the World War II series list page. A list of the World War II series can be seen at the right. Now on the previous slide and shown again here, you can see that we've got 12 returns across two series, 11 serial number records and one in the records of World War II prisoner of war. Maybe this gives us a clue as to why Grandpa Fred doesn't talk about the war. Let's see what we find. Now, reluctantly, Grandpa Fred used to tell stories about f flying in World War II, and therefore, I'm pretty sure that Grandpa Fred was probably an officer in the Army Air Corps. So it's not surprising that he doesn't appear on the ASNF list, although there are other Frederick Irvings on the list highlighted there on the left. As you may recall, ASNF does not contain records of officers, as most, if not all, of the pilots in the Army Air Corps were. On the right, you can see the partial record for Frederick Irving, who was a prisoner of war at Stalag Luft III, a German POW camp located about 100 miles southeast of Berlin 
that housed primarily captured Air Force servicemen. Stalag Luft III was noted for its difficulty in escaping by tunneling, yet in 1944, nearly 100 men escaped through a tunnel, which they had named Harry. Unfortunately, of the 76 men who escaped through the tunnel, only three made it to freedom, while 50 of the recaptured POWs were shot as an example to others. Now, if this all sounds familiar, it's because the exploits were later made into the movie The Great Escape, starring Steve McQueen, Richard Attenborough, James Garner, and many others. Now, Grandpa Fred didn't arrive at Stalag Luft III until after The Great Escape took place, as you can see by his full record shown on the right. By now, if you're a history geek like I fully admit to being, you may realize that Grandpa Fred is actually Frederick Irving, he was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1921. He graduated from Brown University in 1943, go Bears, and joined the Army Air Corps. On his 37th bombing mission, his plane was shot down over Hungary, and he spent the remainder of the war in Europe as a prisoner of war at Stalag Luft III. Following the war and his release from the POW camp, Irving returned to school on the GI Bill and joined the Foreign Service. In 1972, President Richard Nixon appointed Irving to serve as ambassador to Iceland. President Ford later nominated Irving to be Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. That's a lot to fit on a business card. And his final government job was United States Ambassador to Jamaica, a post to which he was named by President Carter in 1977. Armed with Irving's resume, we can use AAD to further document his time in the Foreign Service, which can also be found on the records of AAD. One of the more voluminous series of records on AAD are the Central Foreign Policy Files, known more colloquially as the State Department Cables. By conducting a search across all of AAD in all series, we find 250 records across 11 series. You can see the serial number files fourth on the list, and 189 records for Frederick Irving in the Central Foreign Policy Files, and a portion of the 38 electronic telegrams is shown on the right, concerns Irving's ambassadorial duties and other State Department business. Now that we've looked at people who joined the armed services in World War II and made it through, let's move on to an examination of those who gave the last full measure of devotion and were killed in the service of our country. One of the more popular series on records on AAD are casualty records, six specific to the Korean conflict, four regarding the Vietnam War, and three that contain casualty information from the 1950s through the early part of the 21st century. Let's go looking for Robert Wilson, a veteran of the Korean War. Searching for Robert Wilson, which is an unfortunately common name, yields 128 records across six series. Now let's have a look at the series with the fewest returns, the records of American prisoners of war during the Korean War, indicated by the blue arrow. The full record of Robert Wilson, shown on the lower screenshot, tells us that Wilson was a POW at the Pyeongdong camp and gives us Wilson's name, his serial number, date of birth, rank, and the name of the POW camp, and a dossier number. In the FAQs for this series, we learn that the dossier number will sometimes lead you to a textual collection of records, records of the Army staff, record group 319, located at Archives 2 in College Park. Those records contain an interview of Wilson that was made following his release from Pyeongdong, where he recounts his imprisonment and talks about Chinese attempts to indoctrinate the POWs. Further, with the name of the camp in which Wilson was held, he can go on we can go on to consult yet another series of records, the records of the Office of the Provost Marshal General in Record Group 389. Now these records will tell us all about an intercamp Olympics that was held at Pyeongdong in 1952. POWs from other camps were allowed to interact with one another and participated in many athletic events. We can also learn that Wilson later participated in a soccer match that was dominated by British, British POWs. In addition, among the other records held at the National Archives is a donated collection containing an audio recording of life in the Pyeongtong camp. Armed with Wilson's service number, we can return to AAD to find additional records about Wilson. Looking in the Korean War dead and wounded, we find a number of Robert Wilsons listed, but only one with the service number that we have learned, 
The full record from the Korean Conflict Casualty File, or KCCF, is shown here. It should be noted here that the military considered a POW as a casualty, even those that were ultimately returned to the US military after their imprisonment. KCCF also yields additional information about Wilson, his branch of service, when he was captured, where he was from, the day he was released, and the unit in which he served. Looking elsewhere, one could use Wilson's service number to request his official military personnel file from the National Personnel Records Center. Using AAD, one can search for other individuals who were in the Pyeongdong camp. And with the unit information, we can go down even more roads to find more information about the men Wilson served and what he, that unit did in Korea. You can also consult unit histories in the Textual Archives Unit of the National Archives. For my final demonstration, I'd like to highlight one of the newest series to be added to AAD, the Awards Information Management System, or AIMS. AIMS contains more than one million records of approved awards given to Navy personnel. AIMS was created to support the processing of award recommendations from the Chief of Naval Operations, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Marines are of course part of the US Navy, Semper Fi, and the Secretary of the Navy. The record lists awards approved for individuals as well as the entire units across two, two data files, the public use history data file and the participating commands file. The public use history data file contains records approved of approved or completed awards for individuals and units. The participating commands file contains information about the unit identified in the award records, equivalent to a code list or a table in a relational database. The files contain records for awards that were approved by Navy leadership and entered into AIMS. The use of AIMS began in July of 1988 and contains information about awards given in the Vietnam conflict through the 1990s. As a result, there are some awards outside this time period, including some World War II and Korean conflict awards, as an award may have been conferred long after the incident took place and were subsequently entered into AIMS at a later date. Now you'll note that there are four files listed, two for the participating commands and two for the public history, public use history data file. When the transferring agency, the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, Board of Decorations and Medals, again, try and fit that on a business card, sent the first file to the National Archives, the as of August 1993 file, a public use version was created from this file as there was considerable personal, personally identifiable information, or PII, found in the records, which were then masked in the public use version. The 1993 snapshot contains more than 700,000 records of approved awards. 10 years later, the transferring agency sent updated files to the National Archives. A new public use version was created from the second file, and the number of records increased by more than 300,000 awards. As with the earlier data file, a significant ma majority of the records concern awards given for service during the Vietnam conflict, and only a handful of the records are for earlier incidents or awards either prior to or after the conclusion of the Vietnam conflict. Looking into the records, we can find the records of a prominent American and naval aviator, John Sidney McCain III, Senator from Arizona, Republican presidential candidate in 2008, and distinguished Vietnam War veteran. As most people know, McCain served in Vietnam and spent five years as a prisoner of war during that conflict. By placing John S. McCain in the free, church, free text search box, as shown here, we find a total of 39 records, 20 in the Ames 1994 snapshot, 17 in the 1993 snapshot, and two for the participating commands file. Of those two records in the participating commands file, one is for the individual we are searching for, and the other is for the USS John S. McCain, a Navy destroyer named for the Senator's father and grandfather, both of whom were admirals in the United States Navy. Now, as you can see on this list, John McCain received numerous awards for his service in Vietnam. The highest award he received, the Silver Star, and not just because it's first on the list, was one of many awards he received as a result of being a prisoner of war 
from October of 1967 until his release in March of 1973. Here we can see the full record of McCain's Silver Star Award given for service from October to December 1967, from the time he was shot down through his first three months in captivity in Vietnam. The award was given to McCain in 1974 after his release and repatriation to the United States. Finally, here's one last highlight from Ames, the records for Grace Hopper, a leading pioneer in the computer science field, and at the time of her retirement from the United States Navy, the oldest active duty commissioned officer having attained the rank of Rear Admiral. Here we can see three of the awards given to Hopper, the Legion of Merit, the Distinguished Service Medal, and the Meritorious Service Medal. However, those of us in electronic records will always be thankful to Rear Admiral Hopper for her work in the computer science field, where she invented the COBOL language and gave us the term debugging, which she came up with after removing a moth from one of her computers. So there you have it, a geneal genealogical tour of more than 60 different series of records available in AAD that comprise close to 111 million records. I would be remiss if, unless I pointed out that AAD is not just for genealogists. The records available through AAD include Federal Emergency Management Administration digital photographs of natural disasters and response, government civilian and military contract information, and many other records that detail the many functions of the United States government. AED is lot, a lot like a scavenger hunt. There's lots to find, and while you may not find everything you're looking for, you'll certainly come across something you, that you may not have expected, and you might even have some fun along the way. I'm happy to take your questions, and if you have further questions, please, please feel free to contact the Electronic Records Reference Branch at the telephone number and email address listed here. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was a great overview of AAD. We have two questions that came in from YouTube. The first one, are there any records available from Vietnam? If not, how many years have to pass before they are made available? The, well, we have in AAD, Vietnam records are primarily the casualty information that we have. If the individual is looking for service records from Vietnam, they can get their official military personnel files from St. Louis. So it's, I mean, it's sort of a two-part thing. It depends on what sort of Vietnam records that they're looking for. Okay, okay thank you. And our next question, um, I'm not sure exactly what point they were referring to. They ask, are there similar records for the Navy? Similar records for the Navy as far as Army enlistment records? Is that what they're thinking of? I think that's a good guess. <laughs> okay. Um, what we like to say is that when we get requests for enlistment records, and you know, we have to tell people that the Army enlistment records were destroyed in the fire, what we like to tell people is that the Navy records were not destroyed in the fire. And we like to say because they were all wet because they were in the Navy. Um, but that's just a little joke that we like to use. Uh, so enlistment records, the majority of the records that were burned in the 1973 were Army enlistment records, which is why the, the reconstruction of the serial number file was what was the, that step in the reconstruction process. Now Ames is all Navy. The, what I just finished up with, those are all Naval records. Okay, thank you very much, John. In fact, we have one more question that came in from YouTube. Was the information in the Germans to America passenger data file created from the passenger list themselves? Was it created independently from the book series Germans to America? The, as I explained, the, all of the immigration series that we have was pulled from the original passenger lists by the Balch Institute and then given to the National Archives. So, you know, the, the information that was captured in the actual paper passenger lists was then transferred and digitized into the AED records that we make available through AED. Thank you very much. It looks like we are done with our questions and we appreciate your time.
If the speaker did not get to your question, please send an email to inquire at nara.gov. That's I-N-Q-U-I-R-E at nara.gov. We will now have a short intermission. Our next session will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern.